All right. Um, I really, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, here and then talk about what we do. All right, so uh, this session is uh, focused on quantum surface science at the uh, nano scale. So the first part of my talk, I'll try to give you an overview of uh, uh, what quantum uh, surface science is. And uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about what is a quantumness, right? So here, let me just give you two uh, uh, like pronominal work. One is uh, atomic memory, another was quantum devices in terms of uh, surface science. And then at move on, I will talk about the, what we do, more detail, like great detail, electron spin resonance STM. And then there's just three topics. So first, I'll talk about the single atom ESR, what is driving mechanism, what we do here, and things like that. And then move on, like uh, what we like to do is a nano GPS. I'll give you a few examples that how that can work. Um, and then the, our, one of the recent results about T1 map on metallo organic complexes. And I'll wrap up my talk with the uh, future research goals and summary. All right, so what is a quantumness in, in the surface science, right? So there's a lot of discussion about how you define the quantum. So here I just think about very, very broad topic, right? So first thing is, let's say you have discrete energy levels, right? And then whether you can control them, you can excite the discrete levels back and forth. And the next question will arise basically then, what is the, how long the state could remain, right? So that is in terms of T1 relaxation lifetime. And then second concept is, uh, so basically we have, uh, like for example, if you talk about spin, you apply magnetic field, you're gonna have a g mass exploding, whether you can excite them uh, by uh, either tunneling electrons or uh, using x-ray, things like that. But uh, nowadays there's a more precise, or I would say updated uh, quantum news here. So that is basically, you need, we need basically a superposition of a, the quantum states as well as entanglement. That is, I would say, more precise uh, definition of the current quantumness. And the uh, next question is then how long we can uh, remain the, maintain the, the phase coherence, which is uh, down to a uh, time scale of T2. So that uh, not only having two level system, we need to uh, apply sort of coherent sine wave. It can be RF, it can be light, and things like that. So we should be able to uh, control the spin states with the phase coherent. And on the top of this, you know, more a strict way of uh, defining quantum is you need to have a quantum entanglement. For example, let's say somehow in control manner, you basically uh, control spin up, up to spin up, up, plus down, down, so that if you measure first qubit, second qubit has to be highly correlated, most highly correlated, right? So there's definition of quantum entanglement. So, um, then, in terms of broad uh, quantumness uh, uh, in the surface science, basically, uh, this field has been marching toward to make it atomic scale memory devices. So basically, you want to make a digital bit uh, into the smallest object. It can be atoms and molecules or defects or single molecular magnets. And you can utilize what kind of digital bit you want to map onto, right? So that can be a spin or charge or position of defects. And the tools to make that happen is it can be STM or AFM as well as XMCD in terms of characterizing uh, the property of a uh, spin on the surfaces. So one of the first work is, uh, is done at IBM Research Lab led by the uh, director, Heinrich. So basically, uh, the IBM laboratory, uh, we have uh, manganese atoms and that's deposited onto the aluminum oxide. So you have uh, some decoupling of spin scattering from the conduction electrons. So then if you apply magnetic field, you're gonna have a G-man splitting, and basically this plot tells you uh, the response of uh, spin excitation as a function of magnetic field. So this is basically one of the first uh, spin inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. And you see that there's a step-like increase that's basically due to the, uh, your opening inelastic channel. So there's additional tunneling paths so that you have a, a larger conductance after specific uh, spin excitation energy. So that's what's happening here. And then five years later, uh, uh, in Makigawa's group that uh, deposit iron PC molecules on the copper oxide. This is also sort of thin insulator. And then also observe very interesting spin features uh, uh, using the spin ITS. So then let's say you have a, a spin, uh, uh, you, can, you can measure spin excitation with the atomic resolution of the single molecules, atoms. Next question you're gonna ask then how long the excited state can stay, right? So that is uh, T1. And also the, one of the pioneers in this field is uh, IBM, the Sebastian. 
that uh, he uh, create, uh, he basically make a uh, six ion atom clusters on the copper nitride. It's also a very thin insulator. And basically, it turns out the atoms are coupled through anti antiferromagnetic interactions. And then you can create a new state that can be stable at low temperature for several hours. And matter of fact, basically, uh, the, the Sebastian put the 12 ion atoms together, and then you see that uh, where the first one being spin up or down, you can store information 0 and 1. So that at that time, 2012, like a 12 ion atom is the smallest memory bit. They can store digital information. And surprisingly, one year later, uh, the, the uh, Wiesenlinger group, Alex Kataturian, that uh, he just utilized copper one-on-one -on -one surface. This is a metal surface, and then manipulate individual atoms and sort of form five ion atom clusters on copper uh, surface. And uh, it's a, there's lots of conduction electrons around it, but still, it's surprisingly five ion atom can have a stable magnet or can remain several seconds at low temperature. Um, and then also the in next year, uh, the uh, Sand Autos group that are uh, uh, using copper nitride, but this is a sort of uh, linked to the nitrogen atoms on the copper nitride. But uh, he put in the diagonal direction, and it turns out that interaction is a ferromagnetic coupling, and also the spin change can remain several seconds at very low temperature. Um, so this is STM work, but not only STM. There's another tool called X-ray magnetic dichroism. So basically, you have, uh, you have deposit atoms on surfaces, and you apply a left or right-hand circular polarized X-ray. And depending on different absorption, basically, you can uh, measure what's the spin dynamics of the surface of the collective ensemble of spins. So here, uh, it's uh, basically a pioneer by uh, Harold Bruno's group and Fabio Donati, my colleague, that uh, put the holmium atoms, and at very low temperature, spin lifetime can uh, remain several hours. And actually, even if you increase the uh, temperature up to 40 Kelvin, you can still see very stable magnet. So this is a, a very, very pioneer work. And we basically have an idea of this work, and we, we implemented the Ivan Laboratory so that we uh, deposit holmium atoms on surfaces, and uh, using ESR sensing, we find that we, we can actually control those holmium atoms individual uh, by hot electrons, and that we can control spin states, and we measure those spin states by uh, ESR sensing, dipole sensing, which I will talk about uh, later, so that you can actually uh, the control spin states and read out this is basically really a spin feature, not something chemical uh, feature. All right, so not only this, we talked about spin and charges, but uh, not only this, we can actually utilize the position of vacancies. So here, it's a sand autos group. This is a, a surface of a copper chloride. And matter of fact, uh, you can create chlorine vacancy pretty uh, easily. And then you can actually, using a steam tip, to position those chlorine vacancies, uh, uh, the position uh, where, wherever you want to. So here, uh, if you put the, the, the chlorine vacancy to the up direction, that's, you can define it as a zero. And then if you put one down, that can define it as one, so that you can basically move those uh, chlorine vacancies around and sort of uh, make a, a digital memory. It can be like 100 kilobyte in the uh, very small scale. And so in this one actually remain, this position of uh, the vacancy uh, remains up to 77 Kelvin, liquid nitrogen temperature. So not only atoms, also the molecules. Uh, and then IBM Zurich lab, uh, led by Leo Gross, that uh, basically uh, there's uh, two molecules are sitting on like tens of monolayer of thick uh, salt insulator. And then you can, uh, using AFM, you can actually inject the electrons also so that uh, you can charge uh, the molecules on and off so that you can uh, store information that way as well. And you can prove by uh, the Kelvin Proforce microscope. All right, so this is a very brief and sort of fast uh, historical overview of atomic memory in terms of uh, defining the broad uh, quantumness here. And let's move on to the uh, actual precise uh, concept of quantumness. And here, uh, there's a lot of work is actually uh, done by uh, UNSW, in particular uh, the Simons group that has been working on the phosphorus atoms and silicon surfaces. So basically the idea is that uh, you have your pattern the, the like quantum dust structure in atomic scale, and then basically you prepare clean surface, you put the hydrogen, so the hydrogen will form the bond with the silicon substrate, uh, like dangling bond, for example, and then you basically, uh, using STM tip, apply high voltage, you knock over those hydrogen atoms, so you can pattern the electrodes or uh, the, the quantum dot in atomic scale. And afterwards, you basically uh, uh, evaporate the phosph phosphine, 
and then you anneal the sample, and there's chemical interaction involved that at the end basically the phosphorus atoms will be stuck to the surface. And then afterwards you can uh, evaporate silicon uh, atoms and you can anneal them and sort of uh, cap encapsulate the dopants in the silicon. So then basically you can uh, sort of create the quantum dust structure using the fabrication uh, of uh, STM tip. So there are just so many uh, brilliant work, uh, really uh, 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 great work from the group and uh, glo uh, globally, but uh, let me just uh, uh, wrap up by just one uh, quick slide. This is uh, just published, uh, I think, uh, months ago. And then this is a silicon surface, and basically you uh, pattern it and sort of uh, uh, silicon phosphorus dopants are sitting all those places here. You can pattern with nanometer scale. In particular, if you zoom in here, there's two uh, sort of quantum phosphorus atoms, donors basically, implanted with the uh, separate by only uh, 13 nanometer apart. So that you can control the position of do uh, donors with atomic precision. And also you can utilize those gates, uh, the electrodes, so to control their exchange coupling between two electrons captured by these uh, phosphorus atoms. So, um, and they were the Rabi oscillation and stuff like that. And on the, on, on the top of it, uh, they were able to do a uh, square root of swap gate. Swap gate is a flipping spin state, um, but the square root of it is sort of two qubit gates. Uh, and then, and swap gate is equal to C naught gates, not directly. You need to have some operation, but you can uh, make a C naught gates, which I will not talk about detail here. But anyhow, so that uh, uh, the quantum fidelity, uh, they obtain about 90% for the two uh, uh, qubit wise. Of course, the other architecture, uh, like for example, let's say ion trap, is having 99.99% fidelity of two qubits. Um, and then quantum qubit is 99.95% uh, fidelity and things like that. So the number wise is, uh, is, is all right, but uh, it's, it's uh, not that good. Uh, but uh, in terms of you can control the position in atomic precision, that sort of uh, open very nice uh, the, the path that uh, people can work on. All right, so I was like debating myself whether I'm going to put this, this, this topic here, but uh, there have been known that uh, you may utilize the Mariana fermions for the quantum computing, which there's a lot of debates, and uh, theoretically it's very uh, uh, well mature, but I think experiment wise, so there's a lot of way to go. But uh, there's a, a, a Ali, Ali Azdani's group that is working on the ion chains on, on, the, on the, uh, the lead surface. So it's spoken wire, they have an edge state that is uh, uh, driven by uh, Mariana fermions. And that is also a lot of effort is going on to searching for these uh, Mariana fermions uh, using the STM. All right, so this is a sort of very, very brief overview of uh, the, the quantum surface science. So again, the quantum needs, there's a very broad concept and, and more precise concept. And what we, what the, uh, the, our center uh, basically, the previously, before uh, the center uh, started, mainly working on the, the basically excite the discrete energy levels and try to utilize for the atomic scale uh, uh, memory devices. But uh, now we moving toward to uh, the, the quantum needs, meaning that uh, in precise manner, meaning whether we can apply coherent RF or laser source, whether we can control those spin states with uh, uh, maintaining quantum coherence. And we also uh, like to work on the quantum entanglement as well. All right, so uh, many of you may want the detail of ESR-STM, so I'd like to, I'd actually make this, uh, the first part quite short because I want to give you more introduction about the electron spin resonance. So basically, if you think about the atoms on surface, right, so if you apply magnetic field, then of course you're going to have a Zeeman energy, right? But uh, the atom has a spin and that has a, a orbiting some air, right? So that's angular momentum. So angular momentum and spin couple, and angular momentum is the char electrons uh, like moving around in space. So then if it's sitting on the surface, there's a charge network on the surface, right? So the angular momentum will couple to the charge network. So then angular momentum will be lifted off. So then the spin will couple to uh, the local environment. That's be due to the spin will be coupling. So spin may prefer to specific direction. So that is called magnetic anastropy. So let's say we have some spin number, then depending on your external magnetic field, and then the uh, magnetic anastropy, you're going to have a quantum spin levels. And you can excite the spin state from ground state to excited states by uh, tunneling electrons, for example. So then we can have uh, excited states, and it, we can measure how long does it take to decay to ground state. So that is called T1 measurement. 
but we like to control the, electro, uh, the, the, the spin of atoms using the electron spin resonance. So the system we've been working on uh, mainly is iron atoms. Of course, not only iron ores, there's titanium and copper. Those atoms also works as well in the ESL STM. But I'll mainly focus on iron on MGO. So when you evaporate the iron atoms on the surface, it turns out that the iron atoms preferentially only stick to the oxygen sites. We don't know why, but uh, not only uh, iron atom, cobalt atom also sitting on somehow oxygen site only, but uh, titanium copper is a different story, has a different binding site, and manganese has like four different binding sites, so we don't quite understand the chemistry there. But let's take the iron atom sitting on oxygen site, right? So then you can see as a, if you try to put the spin in the in, in surface, and you see that there's a four uh, magnesium atoms nearby. So it's very highly symmetric. So if we put spin one direction, there will be a lot of degenerate direction of spins. So probably spin preferred to be out of plane. And that matter of fact, that's true. So spin is locked to the out of plane. And that is confirmed XMCD measurement and, and, and DFT and AFM study as well. So basically, our energy level is uh, plus minus two is ground state, and plus minus one and zero. So basically, heavy spin is all uh, ground states. And uh, basically, if we uh, do uh, tunneling spectroscopy, uh, so basically, we, this is an individual ion atom on surface. We park the tip on the top of this uh, ion atom. You ramp the voltage. We can measure a uh, tunneling current. And you see that after 40 millivolt, there's a sudden jump in, in tunneling current. And that's basically before I introduced that the spin in elastic tunneling spectroscopy, right? So that, that is a spin excitation. And if it turns out actually that excitation is not from two lowest stage, that is actually from plus minus two to the plus minus one stage. And uh, if you look at this uh, energy scale into the frequency domain, this is a terahertz. So this is not typical uh, radio frequency. It's, it can be very expensive, and then terahertz is not, it's not easy to uh, create for this moment. So what we are interested in, rather than driving the, the high, uh, big energy level, we like to drive a uh, two lowest level. And here, we apply external magnetic field, an ion atom will be uh, g minus split it. And then basically, if we send the RF uh, frequency to, from the tip to the, uh, the surface, then the electric field will be uh, emitting to the atom on the surface. So then if the frequency matches with the g energy, so then what's going to happen is uh, uh, basically spin may uh, uh, basically populate back and forth. That's what we like to have. So. All right, so our system temperature is a 1 Kelvin. So then if you apply B field, we have a Gman energy. So then uh, electron will populate according to Boltzmann distribution, basically delta E over kVT. That's the concept. So then our 1 Kelvin basically gives you a spin population of being uh, lowest state is about 70%, and here is about 30%. This is not uh, working well. All right, so we like to uh, change the spin population back and forth. So when frequency match with this uh, demand energy, then spin will flip. So then basically, if the spin polarizes down and atom is like this, then there will be tunneling current. But if we flip, if same direction, then we can have a more uh, current flow. So it's a tunneling magnetic resistance. That's why we can see increase in tunneling current. But uh, if uh, spin polarization of TV is opposite, then basically we will see the other way around, meaning that uh, we'll see if the signal is a down, not a, not a peak. So we utilize TMR to, to uh, using sp uh, spin polarized TV to detect the spin states. And here, the, one of the benefits we have is we actually, in, in QNS, we, uh, we uh, uh, recently installed the unicircle STM, and it actually has a, a vector magnet uh, so that we can actually uh, study a variety of the vector fields so that we can understand the ESR mechanism better. We might be able to optimize the ESR signal as well. And this is a signal we got uh, after installation of only three months. All right, so um, this is uh, basically the, the, the schematics of how ESR STM works. But uh, let me go into a little bit of driving uh, uh, the idea here. So basically, here the, we see the peak height and, and width, right? So that is related to spin uh, relaxation time scale as well as dephasing time scale as, as, as well as uh, how we drive efficiently. So the equation is well known. Uh, it's a steady state block equation because we are applying the RF much longer time scale than any of spin dynamics here. So it's relatively a continuous wave. 
So then basically if we, uh, and the Rabi rate, which is how fast we drive the system, is basically overlap between 0 and 1 by interaction Hamiltonian, which can be here is a radio frequency, radio uh, uh, Hamiltonian, which we think is a dipolar coupling or exchange coupling, I'll talk about later. But anyhow, so when we have a Rabi rate very small, then you see that this equation look like Lorentzian right away. And you see that in frequency domain, the line width is limited by T2. So that's how we can measure uh, T2. So T2 is order of 100 nanoseconds, and T1 is we can measure uh, the pump and probe experiment so that we can measure T1. It's about 100 microseconds. And by fitting the peak heights, we can actually get the Rabi time of a microsecond, and that is uh, basically published in science in the uh, four years ago. That was the first ESL STM work uh, done by Suzanne and Paul, also IBM Research Lab. But uh, what we like to have, if we would like to have a full quantumness, what we want to have is uh, the Rabi time is much shorter than T1, T2, so that we can rotate spin back and forth with the phase coherent, right? Uh, without decay. But matter of fact, uh, we are not that case. We are somewhat between. So Rabi time is pretty good for T1, but uh, actually it's longer than T2. And time scale is order of 10 times longer. The Rabi time is 10 times longer than T2 time. So what the meaning is, I'm in North Pole, I like to go to South Pole, and somebody is telling me that you should go that way, right? So one-tenth of time, there's somebody telling me to go that way. So I went step, 10 steps, one step so out of 10, and then I look around, and that guy's gone, and nobody tell me where to go. So I walk, uh, somebody say, go backwards, I'll go backwards. Somebody say, go forward, I'll go forward. So I'll be randomly walking back and forth every uh, one-tenth of steps. So I'll be confused. So if you do temporal average of given spin, then you will do basically average out, and you will get the, the basically saturate to the 50-50. But as I said, we are one Kelvin temperature, so that the, we have a 70% population to 30%, and we saturate to 50-50. Anyhow, we see difference in spin population, and we can detect that. That's how we are seeing this continuous wave ESL signal. So this is the data uh, taken uh, using the municipal machine at QNS. So basically, this is ion atom. We uh, park the tip on the atom, and then we uh, sweep the frequency at given DG field. We see signal here. To make sure this is real, we ramp up the field linearly, and you see the, the frequency shift according to this. So this is a true uh, Gman energy of single atom. So this is uh, uh, one of the first uh, uh, ESRS team uh, working out of IBM lab using the commercial uh, unicycle machine. Of course, we uh, reconfigure the cabling and things like that, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's possible. All right, so we can do the measurement on different atoms. So we have uh, four atoms. We measure exactly the same thing. We see the slope are pretty nice and similar. There's a little bit of deviation that might be due to the local environment differences, atom by atom, because it's sensitive, right? I mean, the atoms, uh, you have uh, some atoms nearby or defects nearby, things like that. Uh, so what we do is uh, here, we change the external PG field, then you, you measure the frequency of ESR, then the slope will be magnetic moment of ion atoms. So by fitting this, we can get the magnetic moment of ion atom. But uh, when we extract those feeding lines all the way to 0, 0,0, it's not crossing there. It's actually there's offset in vertical direction. And that is basically, we're thinking of T field, because as T is spin polarized, and it's only six to seven angstrom away, so there is a magnetic field from the tip, and actually that's giving you offset. So we can extract that. So this is a measure of the four atoms, uh, magnetic moment, which is the slope, right? And this is the average value, and this matches well with the previous work done at IBM. And then also, there's offsets of four atoms, and you, this, uh, this red one is average value. Uh, and then that gives you basically minus 30 millitesla. Minus meaning is opposite uh, with respect to the external field. So we found that, uh, oh, OK, there's a T field, pretty significant effect. All right, so this is a, a external field of 0.14 tesla, right? And then we have a T field, which is opposite direction. So total field is order of uh, making this uh, resonant frequency happening at near 16 gigahertz. And then, then if we put tip closer, then what we do is we're going to increase the T field. So then to see the, uh, the ESR signal at the similar location, we have to increase BG field as well. So we increase BG field to do so, so we can maintain the signal at total field near the 16 gigahertz. And also, we can move T far away, and then we can reduce the T field. Also, we have to reduce BG field to see the similar the, uh, resonance frequency signal. 
right? So then, as, we, as I show you just now, basically, you can uh, utilize the T-field, and T-field is quite strong effect, then why, not, why don't we drive the ESR without any external field? So here, what we do is uh, we slowly ramp down all those external magnetic fields, so without any BXPG field, we were able to drive ESR signal. So this is ESR signal, there's no external field, just using T-field, we drive uh, the ESR. To make sure this is real, we can change the current linearly. Then, you know, current is exponential dis distance, and B field is exponential to distance, so B field and, and the current will be linear. So you see that when you change the linear and current, sort of, you see the linear shift in the ESR frequency. And this work is uh, just uh, submitted uh, about a month ago. All right, so I talked about the ESL, ESL that can be worked without any external magnetic field, but uh, I haven't talked about the implant field, right? As I mentioned, the unicircle has advantage that we can apply implant field. So in, let's say if we move for about one angstrom away from previous condition, tunneling condition, so then TBs are quite far away. Well, far away meaning only one angstrom away, but uh, it's exponential relationship, so uh, we stay far away, but it's not really far away physically. But anyhow, so... Um, when we uh, measure implant field, we just uh, basically measure ESR signal as a function of the parallel field. And uh, we find quite interesting that uh, at the beginning, let's say the ESR peak height, the signal increase, the, the peak height intensity goes up. Um, so that is uh, basically, we can think as, uh, so we are increasing the implant field more and more. And somehow uh, we see ESR peak goes up and then maybe spin polarization got better. Well, if a single paramagnetic spin doesn't make any sense because you follow the spin and ion spin is vertical, so you don't see any signal. But probably we pick up many ion atoms and it's atomic chain, so some components in, in, in plane, but that, that map onto the vertical direction or something like that. That's what we are guessing. And also, if you apply a strong in-plane field, we can mix the spin states of ion atoms, so Ribe rate goes up, so that then might be why we are driving better. But uh, after 1.5 Tesla, it actually goes down. So that is basically, if we apply implant field stronger, stronger, then what's going to happen is uh, you have overlap between two quantum states more and more. So actually T1 goes down slowly. And maybe that is dominating factor uh, over here. That's what you're thinking. Uh, but uh, interestingly, as you see uh, in the low field regime, we cannot see ESR signal. Okay? So that was very puzzling. Um, of course, that can be the other one of this. Spin polarization is bad, maybe, and then spin mixing is bad, something like that. But uh, that sort of makes me think that makes us think that uh, the tip distance is very crucial. So you want to tip closer somehow, then make ESR working. If you tip far away, then implant field is needed, something like that. So we think that probably exchange coupling of tip and atom is maybe a major role for this make ESR STM working. So this is a single atom ESR, so I hope, I hope you uh, uh, give you a good uh, understanding of uh, what's the uh, single atom ESR. And let's move on, what we're going to do with this tool. So uh, first thing is the uh, nano GPS. So there is a three atoms here, um, STM again, advantage uh, at manipulation, right? So you can put atoms together and see their interactions. And it turns out that when I measure this atom, I see there's a four or a signal here. And that is actually quite simple to understand because if there's an atom nearby in this cartoon here, let's say spin is pointing up direction that give you magnetic field to the downward to the atom of interest we are measuring. And if the spin is flipping downwards and it will give you a magnetic field to the upward. So if there's no atom nearby, we're not gonna see uh, any, uh, we're gonna see only single splitting, a single peak, but the fact that, that we have a spin nearby, and if, it, if this is a fluctuating much faster time scale compared to our uh, sweeping frequency time scale, then we can sample this two Gman energy, at, uh, Gman energy. That's why we see a splitting due to the nearby atom. And here we have a two atoms, so two to the two, so we're gonna have a four signal. That's why we see here uh, four signals. And then you see the atoms are close, and this is a further away. So close one maybe give a stronger magnetic field, so splitting will be large. So that may be corresponding to uh, this splitting here. And this atom, uh, this atom is iron and cobalt is far away, so that might be mapping onto this uh, weaker splitting here. 
And then we can measure, again, okay, STM is atomic uh, res uh, resolution, so we can move the tip over I and B and repeat the same experiment. We see also there is a four peaks pop up, uh, same as before. Uh, and as I mentioned, atom by atom resonance frequency is slightly different due to the local environment. So what we do is uh, we line them up, the, large, the biggest peak, and you see that one of the splitting is exactly the same. So that is uh, not surprising, it's, uh, it's because whichever atom we measure, I and R and B, their relative interaction should be identical, right? So that this tells you, oh, finally confirmed that this splitting is due to the I and A and B interaction, okay? And then I and B and cobalt is rather really close, so splitting will be large, that corresponding to this splitting as well as uh, this splitting right here. Okay, so we can identify interaction of individual atoms here. And we can, so we, it shows that uh, there's a splitting, but we'd like to know what kind of uh, physics there, what kind of interactions play a role here. So what we do is, uh, as a function of distance, we measure how much the ESO splitting uh, is happening. And it turns out when atoms are more than one nanometer apart, we found that uh, the curve fits really well to one of our uh, R to the cube relationship. So this meaning one of our cube, that is a uh, basic the electromagnetism right, one-on-one -on -one book that, that shows that uh, that's dipole coupling, magnetic dipole coupling. So that since we have a very precise interaction can be measured, meaning that we can utilize the interaction for sensing. So that's the idea. I think we may change battery of this one or something. Uh, but anyhow, so then as you see here, when atoms are close to one nanometer, actually the major signal is more than dipole coupling. and. It's probably atoms are close to one nanometer, so the wave functions start overlapping each other, so maybe there's exchange coupling kicks in, things like that. So that's probably why we have a, but happen to be, yes, our coupling, uh, the, the exchange coupling makes a higher energy than dipole energy somehow. But uh, there's a lot of great work done by Kai Yang at IBM uh, Research Center. So you can utilize this one to sense the magnetic moment of atoms. And uh, here we have uh, not only iron iron, we can study iron cobalt, iron tall iron. Tall iron is really interesting because whenever I pick up atoms and put down, sometimes atoms appear to be taller. So I thought maybe that's just different binding site, but that wasn't. You see the, it, it matches exactly the center of the grid line. This grid line represent the oxygen site. So this is something to with probably charge state of atom. So we measure the same thing, one of R to the cube relationship. But as I mentioned, the dipole energy has not only uh, the components of uh, interacting terms, you have uh, the distance term as well, like here. But the uh, ion spin locked to the outer plane so that these components all become zero. So this component all goes away. So left over is uh, magnetic moment in Z components only. So then you see that there's offset. So in log log plot, this offset basically tells you the magnetic moment of species you are studying. So you can extract information of magnetic moment. Here, we can get ion magnetic moment about this, and cobalt, and tall iron. So <clears throat> uh, three things. First thing is, you see the arrow bar. This is really precise. It's hard to believe this is a condensed matter experiment without sampling, just a single atom. And second thing is, uh, ion cobalt, if you think about atomic physics, uh, the total spin is six. The magnetic moment is six, so it's very close together. And also tall iron, it's the same ion atom. Uh, but the uh, magnetic moment is one ball magnet reduced due to the different charge states. So this is a pretty interesting platform to understand how charge is connected with the spins in theoretical uh, manner. So uh, we, we, we can measure magnetic moment of single atoms, including unknown uh, species. So what we can do is we can build an atomic structure, 2D array, uh, because 1D array can be done so many other architectures like ion traps and, and other, other STM work. So we build a two-dimensional structure. So this is a pick up one atom, put one by one, and build a five atom type structure here. And then if I park the tip at the center, I see a signal like this. And uh, since the, we have a four atom nearby, two to the four, you should have a total 16 picks, but we only see uh, three. That's because the, the center atom to corner atom distance is the same. So degeneracy kicks in. So that's why. So that basically, first one is flipping only atom of interest we are measuring. Then other picks up basically, except that one, other things are flipping one by one. But I didn't write down as a linear sum because that's not right. Here we are measuring sum of mixture, okay? Not the, the coherent states. So, and things like that. So this is a ratio, but someone cannot believe, well, you don't see other two picks, so we can increase system temperature, then you can push the 
the binomial distribution in higher in frequency. So yes, at 1.2 Kelvin, you see all the peaks recovered. And here, the red one is the, not the fit. This is a theoretical simulation. It matched beautifully well. This is really amazing. Uh, we can also pick up the atom and off-center. Now, distance is all different. You're breaking degeneracy all of it. So you see the old degenerate signal. And the red one is, again, simulation, not the fit. It matched quite well with, the, with the, our measurement. All right, so what we like to do with this is uh, we, there's unknown atoms and molecules. We can want to pick up one by one, put one by one, sort of uh, do the dipole sensing. So we like to do sort of uh, uh, nano GPS. So we like to figure out the spin distribution of the molecules. Uh, that's what we like to do. Um, so, and it works actually. So go back to the five band structure. I say I don't know this atom and try to find it. Okay. So I measure this corner atoms, and you see those ESR signal, and you see, take a look, well, what is this? This is all looks similar, right? It's hard to tell what's going on. But uh, as I said, we can simulate the curve as long as we know magnetic moment, we know their interactions. So that uh, we can simulate the curve, this is a delta function simulated curve, uh, of including all interaction except this guy, okay? So then if I deconvolve our measurement, our measured ESR signal from out of uh, this calculated spectrum, then at the end, the signal we will get is only the, the coupling between the sensor atoms than the atom of interest we like to measure. And yes, after the deconvolution by MATLAB, you see the only splitting pops up due to the interaction of these two. So at the end, we can basically uh, uh, map out. So we have three equations and three unknowns with location magnetic moment, so we can get the exact location. And only the, we got the atom right there, only one angstrom off, and the magnetic moment is within one sigma. So we can do that. So as I mentioned, the mapping spin, the, the distribution of the molecule is a really interesting topic. So before doing it, we were testing TCA molecules. So TCA is a well-known organic magnet, has a spin half system. So if and it's a very uh, uh, has a very high electron affinity. So if you attach the metal atom, there might be charge transfer and spin transfer, things like that. So we like to study that. Actually, there's a tall ion atom here, but as soon as we put the TCA nearby, atom looks disappear. So that was really puzzling. And so what we do is uh, we basically utilize a pump and probe experiment to find the location of the ion atom. And actually, yes, so the ion atom, we, where we, before we attach this any molecule, we see the, the spin uh, relaxation. Uh, so it's a T1 is about tens of microsecond. So we found that. So that then to locate the where ion spin is, we park the delay time as 10 microsecond. You scan it, then you can see the lock and signal. So that's how we can uh, basically finalize where ion atom is located. So we can utilize this technique to identify spins uh, on the pumping probe. All right, so future goal and summary. So um, just to I show you the iron TC and your work, right? So eventually we like to do that using ESR and STM. So we like to sense uh, and spin distribution of the molecules. And if the spin relaxation in the molecule is slow enough, we might be able to map out the dynamics as well. That is uh, something that very interesting we like to do. Uh, and then second thing is a single qubit control for quantum sensing. So the idea is that uh, so far our measurement is all continuous wave, right? So uh, meaning that uh, it's basically T1 limited. I would say as a, that's an average DC measurement. Um, but uh, if we have a spin uh, post DSR, which we already developed, we just need to implement the experiment. Uh, so if we put the spin to the equator, and then due to the interaction with the spin nearby, the phase will accumulate. So we can map out this spin uh, phase uh, information uh, by uh, post-DSR, which is AC sensing. It's a really well-known, historically, more than 50 years in the community of NMR technique. There's lots of dynamic decouplings and things like that. So we like to implement that and to do so. But uh, before doing that, we like to have a better, uh, better uh, uh, spin coherence, uh, phase coherence, and we are testing uh, different type of atoms as well. So summary, ESR, you can work without any magnetic field nearby, uh, external magnetic field. And we were showing the T1 map, and we are pushing direction of nano GPS as well as a uh, quantum sensor by controlling a uh, single qubit of, of the spins and surfaces. And let me just uh, show you, uh, actually, 
there are uh, other groups are catching up now, and there's uh, at least more than four groups can do ESR and STEM this moment. So IBM started 2015 this work, and then the, uh, 2019 there's a paper published uh, Harold Bruno's group uh, ETFL uh, uh, Switzerland, and basically uh, using very similar technique as us, we apply uh, uh, the microwave uh, the, uh, the, the microwave voltage through the from tip to the sample. Uh, and then the, we did it. Uh, we just uh, submit the paper about this. And then send the all touch group and Delft is unpublished, but uh, using very similar way as, as, uh, as what we do. Um, and then actually, surprisingly, it just published in uh, the, the August that uh, Peter Gambredala group, ETF Zurich, that they succeed the uh, ESR STM with a radiative uh, uh, way. So that you have a tip nearby, another secondary wire nearby, and you're radiating to the tip and uh, the sample junction. And actually, in this case, they show that transmission is way better than us. So that's uh, really interesting. Uh, so that this uh, ESR STM field is uh, really growing and sort of uh, heating up. Who is next? It can be you, right? <laughs> All right, so let me wrap up my talk. This work cannot be done without really great crew, okay? So in, in, in my subgroup, that uh, really, I feel really happy that work with these brilliant people with me. And particularly, we have uh, uh, four really brilliant posta, Phil and Sue and Appa and Tana. So if you guys see them, please ask lots of questions about more detailed information. Um, and please, uh, please uh, 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 talk with them. Uh, we have a graduate student, Mini, as well, and this is uh, uh, myself. Thank you very much.